the crashes have, have come unexpectedly. So, you know, the financial crisis in 2008 was... Was that unexpected? Well, it was at the time. It was a <laughs> yeah. sharp, sharp reaction to sharp. some... It, was, to it some. was a surprise to everyday people. Yeah. <laughs> human and economic behavior yeah yeah i mean it's, and is it that human economic behavior is is something that i really want to focus on now then because okay. if i'd have done an apprenticeship somewhere i i might have been in the local borough that i grew up in i, I, yeah, just, I don't know yeah, we don't yeah, know exactly, where yeah. life takes us but i i am thankful for that for that and that was through a university an indirect part of it um yeah. as i said at the start the skills that i learned on the syllabus that I think you know have taken me through you know key parts of my of my sort of 30s if, if, if we're trying to benchmark my age <laughs> so, <laughs> don't worry you know, like, we, don't have, we don't have to go that much detail it's fine. But, yeah. hello everyone and welcome to the daniel lee's podcast today's episode will come on to shortly but we just want to thank our sponsors wasta.ai for powering the podcast if you haven't checked them out already head over to wasta.ai and check them out because they're the professional networking Tinder for the Middle East. So you can connect with different professionals here. So if you're trying to expand your network or you want to move here, these are the perfect guys to use their platform to make sure that you can meet other fellow professionals um, in so many different industries. So go check them out and guess what? It's absolutely free. So why not just check it out? Because it's free. So today's episode... We're going slightly educational, let's say, educational. I'm joined by a doctor, not the sort of doctor that's going to save me if I have a heart attack today. However, uh, he's a professor of real estate and I really wanted to, to dig into his brains and talk about a lot of topics because he's a professor in real estate. Uh, which is obviously we're here in the UAE and real estate is is huge here and it's it's a, it's a big driver to the economy um, but also talk about the bigger picture of real estate globally some of the events that are going on right now in the world which obviously control um, the, that type of industry so and also we're also going to be talking a lot about education and the importance of education because it's something that we underestimate on the podcast and um, we're going to hear the counter argument today of why university still has a place for people today. So without further ado, let's get into the podcast. Thanks again for coming back and listening. And um, today's episode is with Dr. Michael Walters. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> oh, yeah, you yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. So very well. Thank you. Very well. Um, so how's the start of the year been 2022 we're already midway through feb yeah no it's all good all good um uh the well if we're talking education the academic year is is uh in in full swing so we, we've got a lot of excited students around the campus as you as you've seen um as you came in so yeah all good and um yeah no, no, no issues to the start of the year. Yeah, good, good, good. So, in terms of, I mean, we're in um, Harriet Watt University. That's where you're, you're a professor. Yeah. Um, it's a brand new campus. Looks absolutely stunning. Um, it's quite. It must be quite nice to have a, a new place to work, new technology to work on, and, and stuff. Yeah, it, it definitely. It's definitely changed the. Uh, well, it's it, it's come at a very um, suitable time. I think uh, you know, coming out of COVID or. Or managing ourselves out of out of COVID, um, we've we've been able to utilise a much more digitally enabled campus. So, students who are with us, who are stuck in different geographies um, over the world, can still connect into their learning environment, yeah. and we can interact as closely as possible uh, as we can. Do you find a lot of people have kind of gone back to kind of their home countries and just carrying on their education online or it's gone a lot more back to face to face? Um we've we've seen well again in in my field in in real estate we've we've seen we've seen a big return back to the campus. I think we including myself we were missing that human that interaction in, interaction yeah. of of seeing people looking puzzled and <laughs> confused as as you sometimes do in a, in a university. But also, more importantly, you know, gauging whether people are understanding what we're talking about or what I'm talking about, you know, having tutorials and getting them to solve problems together 
is a lot easier in a physical environment than yeah. than an online one. Um, but it's also enabled us to reach much further globally. We've 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 really expanded some of our online offerings, which means that the education that we give is is more inclusive. Which is one of the, I think, one of the focus uh, focus points of universities today is that it's a much more inclusive. Uh, environment than it probably was historically mm. and if if i was to go back and ask um younger michael yeah did 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 younger michael ever see himself being a professor um <laughs> i mean to be honest uh no i mean i'm you know real estate's one of those uh sectors where you know that was my that was my area once i'd i'd studied land economics and you know looked at cities and i was i was naturally interested in in those topics it was it was then thinking you know how can i build a career uh that's gonna you know that i can live comfortably off and give me the things that i was measuring a successful career against um so my dad was an accountant and he tried to kind of push Push me that onto you yeah twist the arm down the uh, uh, accounting that wasn't really something that i i took on or or had any interest in And, and real estate and surveying was was probably a, a nice mix between a, a business financial world and a and a property and urban city development world. Yeah. So, and then as I took on some jobs, you know, when I as you first start out, you try a few jobs, don't you, and you see what you like and see what suits you. I, I started off as an estate agent. Um, obviously, wasn't that great at at it, but I enjoyed it. it. Was in a part of the country in the UK that I enjoyed being out meeting people, um, but found that. Uh, you know, numbers, research and academia was probably where I was best placed. So then I took on a role at Reading University down down just outside London in the southeast. Yeah. Um and and, and then did my masters in real estate with, with them. Did a few years in, in in London in commercial practice and then one of the real uh, drivers I guess for coming out here in two thousand and nine was the real estate market was was in the headlines, but but needed developing and and being part of that educational process in Dubai and and having an opportunity to mould certain things in the market or at least feel like I'm moulding certain yeah. things. Um, then you know that was a really attractive place for me at you know mid twenties to come out here and and deliver that. So I've been doing that for for thirteen years. Wow. And when you was um, when you decided to study, like you say, you studied land economics. What else did you study? Well, it was it was it was economic geography actually. If I'm being being uh, or human geography, they called it back okay. in the day. So there was physical or human. It was human geography topics around. Um, we we covered things like statistics, data analysis, geospatial analysis. I mean, a lot of things are coming full circle now, in especially in the real real estate sector, where you know the importance of data. And knowing how to analyze it and utilize it is much, is much more important. I think we've gone through a wave with the internet where we feel that information is is there readily available. If I need to find something, I'll just search for it. We've we've lost that ability, or well, not not everyone, but you know, as a as a as a population, I feel like we've lost that ability to think critically about information, and and those things are starting to come back in our syllabus in the real estate sector for the importance of making more informed decisions and um you know data analytics is is obviously a big thing in in many sectors but also in development decisions and so mm. on in real estate so i enjoyed that side of um my educational background i think you know it has it's never really left me similarly with the the masters in real estate that i did i learned a lot of financial um tools which have helped me personally to think about you know money and investing and you know appraising even real estate um purchases myself so you know there's certain things that when you look back on your education they don't necessarily feel like it at the time but you you do take some real world application to those so i think those things have helped mold my you know the way i teach now is is trying to embed those skills um that are, that are practice led uh, yeah. to help to help the the graduates you know be be valuable to a, to a company or or be valuable for their own personal investing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I can't really 
speak from personal experience because never went to university. Mm. Um, but obviously, what you what were they, what they were teaching you back then, like how are you being able to stay current with you know an ever changing world? Because mm. obviously, what you learned back then is a completely yeah, course, different yeah. space now, right? So, how are you able to kind of keep up to date with with all the regulations and all the changes yeah. and all, everything evolving? Well, I think one of the important things that universities recognise now uh, is that relevance. You know, being being globally relevant, it being it, having an international outlook, but also capturing people so that they feel that when they leave, they're they're ready, they're future ready, is the term that we use here at the university. So one of the ways that I do that personally is is ensuring that there's a network in industry that I'm liaising with i'm speaking with i'm having you know we're having you know q and a's over over topics on so that you know i'm up to speed with what's going on in in dynamic mm. dubai basically so you know it changes quickly and you know one of the things that you you know you have to do as a as an academic is to ensure that you are staying relevant with what with what you're teaching yeah um so you know thinking about global assessments really came about um through covid really and thinking like well i'm talking about this topic to a group in in edinburgh who don't know the dynamics of dubai and and vice versa you know there's buildings and case studies we're using in in the uk that aren't wholly relevant to dubai so how do we find that balance to get an inclusive space but yeah. also where people can feel like okay you know if i want to c come to dubai and work here these are the this is the state of the market compared to a market that I'm more familiar with. So, I mean, from a personal level, I enjoy engaging with the industry and um, helping the students find find placements, work, uh, as, although it's not a recruitment line for myself. But it means that I just feel, you know, my, my mind is, is, is working. Yeah. And, and um, you know, hopefully they find benefit speaking to me. Yeah, I mean that's and and that's one thing as well is is you know some of the comments that I've had from people that have joined the show before is, you know the people that are teaching don't necessarily have the the the, the life experience but obviously we met at a real estate event where mm -hmm. you are working with real life professionals frequently mixing yourself amongst um, the people that are working um, everyday jobs with some of the biggest agencies in the world so again it's what you're doing is you're staying current with. The, the, the global trends, the global market, what's actually happening, what's going on and, and keeping up to date for that. So kudos to, to keeping yourself up to scratch because there's a lot of tutors out there and academics and professors and they're just, they're so old fashioned, right? I mean, we, we, yeah. some, we're, we're talking on a general perspective here, um, but obviously being able to stay current and, and also helping your students then with moving on afterwards is obviously a huge benefit to them. And that in itself is, is, is an added value. But I suppose that leads quite nicely to the question that I have is, again, I know it's a general question, mm -hmm. but outside of um, stuff like being a doctor or a heart surgeon, or yeah. um, is there a place for university or is real life experience more important now? Because I'll just, I'll, yeah. just, I'll just make one because you're itching to ask this question. <laughs> yeah. If you're not watching the YouTube version, head over because he looks like he's about to rip my head off. No, um, but no, on a serious note, um, I was chatting to a friend the other day. Mm -hmm. She got her own recruitment business and she was saying about how one of her student, sorry, one of her um, employees that went to university um, is kind of almost feeling like she should be higher up in the business than people that have been there for a longer period of time. But she was explaining, you know, like you went to university, this person's been here since they were 18 years old. They've had, you know, on the, they've had like hands on experience with, with what we do as an industry. So this is why she's at this period. You will get there, mm. but yes, you, you went to university. However, you've not had the real life experience within what we do. So bearing all that in mind, yep. far away. Well, I think you know. I think what you're saying is is is, is totally valid. Um, the, and and I think the I think the worlds of uh, well, you know, it's a blended line between balancing, you know, your your higher 
academic qualifications and your work experience and I think when you're setting when you're starting out um, you have got off you have got some heavy lifting to do in those first f- first few years whether you whether you leave school at 18 mm. or or you choose to go to university um, and you and you enter the workforce it, it's only until you have that you know that solid one or two years of experience in a relevant field that you can start yourself feel yourself you know moving up I think what university does for for people who who are planning a, a career you know like I'm saying you know for my own case real estate was something I wanted to enter enter into I, I looked at the MSC as a, as, a, as a stepping stone there it often fast tracks you into a career um, of course in 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 real estate as a discipline you've got success stories with people earning huge sums of money who haven't gone to university and then there's areas of the sector that are closed to graduate qualified surveyors so you you would you know a bank coming to you Daniel to sign off a secured lending for a mortgage or for someone's home they're not going to let you sign that off but if someone's qualified chartered surveyor normally that's done through a university uh, you know our postgrad example you know, two, yeah. two two years postgrad and one year post qualification so you're looking at a three year they accept they do accept people with 10 years experience but you know three years versus 10 years the university does fast track that qualification route um it also gives you a bit of a, i mean I, it, it again depends on the environment it gives you a network of like-minded people to that, that often you're carrying with carrying with you throughout your yeah. your career i mean I, i'm on the postgraduate level i'm still in touch with people that i i studied with i still call them for advice and and a, yeah. and a chat so you do have that although you can also get that outside university it you've you've kind of built you built building those stronger relationships within a within a learning environment and a lot of universities now are looking at at, at what you said at the start you know and bringing in apprenticeship schemes and, and work placements as part of the study program so you know i know harriet what we have we've launched some of those kind of products where we're trying to bridge that gap so students are coming out graduating and they've they've had the academic and they've got the work work placements as well so yeah. th- i think yeah I, I think if a university or if a graduate should i say feels that on qualification there's a, a right to passage to a certain level you know those days have gone statistics of you know two percent people you know back 30 years ago two percent would go into university and now that's double digit percentages a lot higher so i do think advice to anyone who's looking or thinking about university is you know plan where you want your career to go and it'll work for you but if it's you know if it's just because you've got a degree it's a right to passage. It, it's going to be a bit of a struggle, I think. Yeah, and I think do you know what? And and with it is it's a subject that comes mm. up all the time, and um, and it's one that I've started to have conversation with more people that have gone to university. And what you said, pretty much, is what they say. You know, sometimes okay, it's not the education element that I really benefited mm. from. However. Um, you know, I've built relationships with people that will be lifelong. And like you say, you know, you can call these people up and, you know, ask for advice and, 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 you know, um, seek uh, information from, or even do deals with, you know, and Mm. that's something that, you know, university buddies, you know, we went to, we went, we we went to university together and, and, and that bond is, is like you say, it's, 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 solid for for life so and that's what i'm starting to find a little bit more out so it's really good to understand the flip side of the other side of the argument right and like you say with everything in life is if you can get one thing from it then you know it's more than enough right and nine times out of ten we will go to university for business and Mm. if you can do business deals from these later on down the line then you know everyone's uh, everyone's winning well, I think yeah. There's also some, you know, there's there's if you think an 18 year old, you know, global. We've got a go global initiative here at the university, so you you have options to if you're based in the UK or vice versa to come and study in Dubai or or Malaysia. You know, I did a study semester abroad. That was the best. That one of the highlights of my my experience. I met people from as far as Mexico to 
to the country that I was in, which was Finland. So wow. it was just a semester, so it was four months. <laughs> but, you know, 20 years on, we're all still connected with, I mean, we've all got families, most of us now, so yeah. uh, we're, all, we're all complaining about the sleepless nights. But um, <laughs> no, we're still in touch with each other. And, and that, you know, that that developed me as a as a as a person I think you know my my outlooks and similarly coming to Dubai again you you know that you have a certain outlook you know outlook on international concepts or or things that just you just you either that you either enjoy that kind of um of kind of life and that and that that guided me to you know I want to go and st- I want to go and work abroad I don't want I don't want to work in the UK I don't want to I don't want the London job or, you know, yeah. it, it changed my, my outlook, which, you know, looking back, I, if, if I'd have done an apprenticeship somewhere, I, I might have been in the local borough that I grew up in. I, I, yeah, just, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we don't yeah, know exactly, where yeah. life takes us. But I, I am thankful for that, for that. And that was through a university, an indirect part of it. Yeah. Um, as I said at the start, the skills that I learned on the syllabus that I think, you know, have taken me through you know, key parts of my, of my sort of thirties. If, if, if we're trying to benchmark my age, <laughs> so, <laughs> don't worry. You know, li- li- we, don't have, we don't have to go that much detail. It's fine. But yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I, I think there's been some, sk- you know, academic skills that I've learned um, and I've benefited from. And yes, to, you know, we can look at, you know, we can look online and find learning resources, but they're not structured like they are in a university environment. We, we have it, we, you know, we have a lot of industry come in, students in the classroom are benefiting from understanding the context of the academic work with with practice and, and thinking about those things so universities generally are trying to scope out and make graduates make it easier for them to find jobs i mean that's that's one of the reasons why you go to university is to yeah. secure a job in a field that yeah. that university is well known for so i suppose it's like everything in life that you get good and bad universities right and the bad universities do, yeah. that ones that give you give the reputation of university was a waste of time mm. i suppose right whereas it's not all the it's not always the same but also the doors are never closed on you know we we, we allow students to come in with eight years experience they haven't got a bachelor's degree so that option is is always there on the postgraduate side where you we are validating we are recognizing someone who might have missed out on education whether that was a choice or whether that was mm. other reasons that we don't need to yeah. concern ourselves with before but, before it would be like a privilege wasn't it yeah, it's like you had to get certain grades to go yeah. to university and yeah my parents that was that they had a test and that test dictated whether they went to university and there was no back you know there's no revisiting it it, it was all done at a fairly young age and and that wasn't a fair system mm. Yeah, so you're you're a very well decorated um, professor in what you do. So let's talk Thanks. more in detail. <laughs> yeah. Let's let, let's talk more in detail about your qualifications and, okay. and, and what you hold as a professor. Okay. Um, well, I yeah, I've got a bachelor's and a and a master's, um, as I've already said. I've also got um, a professional qualification with the RICS I'm a member of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors so that's been done through um, the professional assessments through the RICS and then more recently obtained a PhD in, in real estate which sounds a bit of an odd um, wow. odd accolade really but yeah. Um, yeah, a PhD is basically you know, an extensive study on a, on a topic and I chose uh, commercial property valuations in Dubai and understanding why valuations might differ between different valuers valuing the same assets yeah um yeah it was just <laughs> it was it's, it's, it's enjoyable to me to to, to but to, no but to the, thing, the thing is it's, it's also fascinating to understand as well because you know these are the things that define a place define mm. an economy right because without real estate what would be an what what would economy look like mm. you know um but it's, it's it's really interesting to find out and understand because Obviously, the real estate market in the UAE is, is slightly different to what you get in, in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, build quality, for example, um, all the services and loads of differences in the properties. So what, I mean, talk us through how a property is valued and what makes it valuable um, in this particular country. Okay, well, the I guess the attributes of, of real estate don't differ hugely um, 
between Dubai and say London, for example, uh, you know, from, from on a residential asset, you know, if you're on the waterfront, you've got a great view. Uh, you've got I mean, supportive amenities around you, mixed use, you've, you know, cafes, restaurants, uh, shopping districts, and so on. Accessibility. They're the, those. Those are the major drivers for for real estate values in in, in a residential setting. And in a commercial setting, like an office or a mall, um, it's income producing. So we take, you know, what's the cash flow? What's the future anticipated cash flow? And what, what are investors, you know, assessment on on the risk of that? You know, that's expressed through a yield and it's just a multiplication of, of that. So, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the value, um, the valuation of commercial units is literally a multiplication of, of risk or perceived risk. So that's that's changed a lot in Dubai. You know, obviously, you know, when I was first when I first came here, everyone wanted a ten percent yield on a residential purchase, and now we have more more data, more information, and we know you'll be lucky to get ten percent these days with 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 yield compression. So, um, yeah, I think I think the valuation principles are not too dissimilar. We live in a bit of a unique place here because of us, you know, the skills and training of of valuers in the commercial world are. Are all you know, you know, coming from all different markets, um, so you know that does create a bit of um, a, a bit of differences in in methodologies and so on. But we should we should be in a ballpark figure and yeah. agree on that, particularly if we're coming from you know the RICS. If we're all RICS qualified, we we kind of follow the, the print guiding principles of them to value. So the way we value things and and the way people attribute value to those. Um, is 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 how it's how it's derived basically yeah now you mentioned about um compressed yield yeah um a second ago which obviously landlords expected when they invested in real estate but what's actually been the contributing factor to compressing the yield well often in um often in again a good example is like you know the institutional pension fund buying commercial commercial assets with with good tenants I, you know, a strong cash flow, low risk. Um, you, you, the money's all chasing the same asset types. The type that you know, the the single owned, what we call institutional office block with someone like Google or Microsoft in, is a fantastic income producing asset for for anyone who holds that. Yeah. And and of course, if that if the money if the capital is is chasing those core assets, so you've got core markets like London, New York, Frankfurt, and so on. That's where capital is deployed, and everyone's following those sort of same directional patterns. You're gonna you're you're setting yourself up to to be buying at a low yield, because yeah. obviously everyone's chasing and looking to purchase those those assets. In in emerging markets, you can carry risk. You 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 you're obviously looking for for capital growth, and you, but but with that you're carrying more risk, and therefore the assets are priced with a bit of wiggle room for that risk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So example, like this university, you've got um, Harriet Watt University. Next door, you've got the University of Wollongong. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> and then across the road, Google's Google's uh, yep. Dubai office. Yeah, Google, so, Ericsson. Google, C Ericsson. C C is Siemens there as well? I you got so. you got Huawei across the road as well. Mm -hmm. BT. I mean, like that as obviously is what it's going to do is straight away as soon as these people are based here mm. or these companies sorry not people as soon as these companies are based here that's obviously going to drive up the the real estate value here right mm -hmm. yeah no i mean certainly i mean certainly we see examples in the market where because we have quite a, a lack of what i call you know the institutional core assets you know though again People are wanting expo or funds are wanting exposure to the Middle East now, mm. and 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 again that you'll see some yield compression. But you're starting off, you're starting at a higher point. So, a few years ago, commercial yields were like eight percent. Now you might find something below six, mid fives. That's, that's kind reasons. of like a steady investment, though, isn't it? Now you know. Yeah. I think once things become more popular, right? Yeah. I mean, like if you look at, let's talk. about I mean, in specifics, the crypto market, it's becoming a more mature market before you came in early on, huge risk, big rewards yeah. as well. But now 
you know the although it's just dropped a huge amount it's becoming more mature so the more popular it becomes like you say it just becomes you know less volatile but also um less reward by the end of it well markets need to find their find their flaws and their ceilings don't they and i think yeah. property cycles which is something that again i teach on you you see the volatility in the early years so in the 1990s and in the UK, 1980s, 1990s, you had a high high amount of volatility there. Yeah. Um, 2006, 7, 8, we saw volatile spikes and drops. Yeah. It's much smoother now. Yeah, so with, with the property cycles then, so when we talk about a property cycle, what we're actually talking about is when it peaks, when it hits an all-time high, when it goes back down, crashes yeah. due to one reason or another. Yeah. Um, how can we stop crashing? Because it tends to be a, a typical cycle, yeah. right? Every 10 years, yeah. roughly. Seven to eight years in yeah. the UK. If we want so how, can, yeah. how, how can you stop that now? Because obviously... It's, well, the, the things, you know, again, the foresight is... Um, and I know it's, hindsight it's actually, do you know what? I'm really sorry for yeah. asking that question because yeah. it's a very difficult question to even answer, but... Yeah, and, well, the, the thing, the, the easiest way to answer it is that the crashes have, have come unexpectedly. So, you know, the financial crisis in 2008 was... Was that yeah. unexpected? Well, it was at the time. It was a <laughs> yeah. sharp, sharp reaction to sharp. some... It, was, to it some. was a surprise to the everyday people, yeah. not yeah. the bankers. No, and then, uh, you know, the health crisis, COVID, that was... That was unexpected, shock, yeah. shock to the system. You know, oil price crashes... Um, yeah, these events are, are, are you know are external to property markets and there's you know limited you know limited room for isolating yourself against yeah. those so i think cycles are, are just part of i mean any investment has cyclical behavior and that and largely it's driven up you know human behavior behavioral economics is a big part of understanding property cycles a lot more than we perhaps were so again people's um and you mentioned bitcoin you know that kind of euphoria of 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 getting onto a a cycle is is where you, you're finding the ceiling and then you soon find the floor once once there's been a an exuberance there so but i think just generally you know cycles are with us in any investment there's going to be volatility there isn't a, a straight line investment where it it goes up without any any problems yeah um, so yeah i it's mean all, all part of um human and economic behavior yeah yeah i mean it's, and is it that human economic behavior is is something that i really want to focus on now then because okay. i suppose a lot of people will be listening to this podcast and there'll be a number of um accusations let's say on who's at fault for these um uh you know for, for these incidents because like you say it's always humans that create it but when you're i mean i'm just asking a question literally mm -hmm. thinking out loud but yep. for me when i look at it right apart from like you say covid most of the time you know there's been downturns in the market or crashes due to people of power being greed greedy right if you do the research on for example the financial crash in 2008 why was that because all the bankers were just screwing over people that you know that didn't have that much money and inevitably got to the point where it got so bad you couldn't mm -hmm. return from that so from from i suppose the question i'm asking is it, it is human well i wouldn't call it economics like destruction at the end of the day because we're always the ones that create it and it, it's always you know like i'm trying to find the right words to explain it but it's like we're so destructive to the point of that's why there's cycles. We never learn from the stuff that happened previously. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's an element to, to, to that. And I think, yeah, obviously we live, you know, governance and, and um, I, we, we, can, we could call it greed if, if we want to have a term, uh, you know, the financial component. Um, but largely a lot, a lot of the triggers are, you know, it's the uncertainty. So like, you know, again going the health crisis you know we've never dealt with it we didn't know what it was going to do we were we were pausing the economy so we, we were get it was our reaction to it was was hurting us it was like one of those things that you know we want to get out but we were doing it to protect 
well, all of us, but also vulnerable parts of the of the population. We hadn't gone through that period. We didn't know how to manage it. Now we're now we're eighteen. What is it? What two years on now mm. from from that? There's probably a perception that it can be managed, and you're seeing that with you know we're not you know the there's a reduction in the 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 stay at home number of days to self isolate if you've had close contact in in certain markets. There's a relaxation of of social distancing measures here. I think coming in tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, in in you know we've got full capacity in other places. So there's probably a a, a view now that we've lived through enough of it that it's no longer and uncertain it can be managed so once you reach those stages in in something like the health covid crisis then of course that's why we've got yeah. that rebound back up and we've got a bit of a, yeah. a normality there see what you mentioned there is very um, relevant and i completely agree but that's related to a global pandemic that's related to health mm -hmm. so in terms of financial crashes that are caused by Human, how yeah. do, human economics yeah how do we prevent that in the future well we we have regulate you know regulation is supposed to protect us you know us from every day yeah, from yeah. banking you know from from banking and exploitation or, or banking basically greedy bankers <laughs> i mean that was driven by you know again pushing you know pushing the boundary of th things and, and there is there is a view that um yeah, there is a view that regulation needs to needed to be better. I mean, even the rating of these products mm. that you know you you were selling them, they were AAA rated or you know whatever ratings. It was just a, a ben, you know benign pro process because you had a lot of bad debt wrapped into them. So mm. there was a business case for the product, and it got pushed to the to the limit of what was reasonable, and it left it left the impact that we had to live through as mm. a result. So. In that case, yes, is is a modern example of where the banking sector kind of um, unravelled, and and it was at our expense. Um, but you know, regulation is there to to help mitigate those risks. Um, you know, lending requirements and so on. So you know, for example, in the UK, you, you, you know, they were lending above a hundred loan to value for for residential property. You know, you could take more debt on. Than the actual house was worth. I mean, if you said that, you know, you said that now, it's well, why would they do that? It just seems idiotic. But um, you know, now you've got loan to value ratios that are, are much lower and more reasonable. As much as it was painful to live through that crisis, that's one of the things that have, have come out that you know we don't see those that aggressive lending anymore. Yeah. So we've learnt our lesson in, yeah. in that case. Yeah, I suppose that's eventually kind of going to evolve. Um, as a market like and, and as an industry right but um but i mean at the moment there's obviously after covid there's been a huge increase in property prices you know i did a really uh, i did a podcast with a real estate agent last week yep. and you know he's happy is he ah uh, <laughs> i mean he did 194 million dirhams worth of transactions yep. so i'm guessing he's quite happy yeah yep. but um but yeah, no, I mean, like I was talking about the statistics and there was like over 84,000 transactions last year mm. and obviously property prices going up. I mean, there was an increase of property price by like 73%. Um, there was 63% more transactions than the year before that, mm -hmm. obviously, understandably. But um, when does it hit the peak? When does it stop? Well, the thing, the, the, the forces of, of change that came out of COVID is that people are putting more value to, to residential space and yeah. what Dubai value in their home just in case they get locked in there again well exactly and, and you know there's um, and Dubai offers big spaces here for, for both residents and, and further afield so it, it, people have realigned their um, maybe their investment philosophies to, to a com you know to put value on you know the race for space is, is a term that is banded around at the moment you know people are looking for, for bigger places it's driven the, the the villa and you know villa communities have saw that initial growth in 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 transactions and values you know now we're seeing larger apartments catching up um mm. so when you you asked when will we hit the peak um so can we hit a peak though to be honest because i well, mean we'll come on to inflation later yeah, on and, yeah. and 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 interest hikes and stuff yeah 
And uh, for me, what, what concerns me about what's going on right now is, you know, not many people seem to piece the information together, but mm -hmm. property prices are increasing. Yeah. You know, you only really would typically have a fixed mortgage for a period of time, mm -hmm. um, three to five years maximum, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if obviously inflation is coming in, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it's a problem and then interest rates are hiking, surely yeah. it's going to get to the point where everyone's going to remortgage after three to five years mm -hmm. and they're all going to be screwed because they can't afford to pay for their property anymore. Well, the bank, the, I mean, if you took out a product now, I think just from, from sort of off the top of, you know, you're looking at sort of around the 3%, you can fix a mortgage for about 3% for five years here, which is, as you say, attractive for that first five years. The eyeball rate, which is is what's a um, three-month eyeball, is what normally a, a, a mortgage is tracked against here, plus a fixed margin. So again, that's really important to look at before you sign up to anything like, you know, what is that fixed, what is that reversion going to be? So, so there's like a regulation against how much they can... In so a bank will go, like, well, once you finish that fixed rate period, the way that we're going to decide how much we're going to charge you as interest is going to be a fixed margin, which might be 1.5%, 2%, plus the three-month eyeball rate, which moves in line with with the increases from the central bank. So, you know, a 1.5% margin plus, let's say, 2 or 3% as, a, as an eyeball, which at the moment is around half a percent. So if we saw a few chunks, you're looking at, What's that from my top of my You're looking at sort of, you know, 4%. Four, four so you, you're not, you're, it's another sort of 100 basis points on the cost of your mortgage. So there's that to consider. And I think it's important that, you know, people do look at the longer term cost of their mortgages. That probably doesn't, con that's probably not hugely concerning for, for the majority. 60% of property transactions in Dubai are done in cash. 40 in, two, in 2021 at least in cash yeah so in cash. You, we just gotta we just gotta remember that <laughs> so 60 percent of 2021 was, was cash deals 40 percent more so it's a small pablo small, now owns the palm yeah yeah small <laughs> part of um of the, and i think going back you know height you know if we go back to the financial crisis what we saw was again irresponsible lending people can afford the mortgages um you know interest rates weren't particularly low but they just couldn't they couldn't afford the the mortgages that they took on yeah um so i think with loan to value ratios there's a protection there to stop sort of forced distressed sales that would crash crash a market so i'm not saying it's going to skyrocket and keep going up 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 because up, because markets don't but am i concerned that interest rates are going up to combat inflation not at the moment if it's done steadily and and slowly but let's see <laughs> who knows who knows um you know obviously we'll 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 never really get to know the full picture because obviously we're not part of that world but um but yeah hopefully it's it's more controlled because like like you say it's it's the everyday people that just work their asses off every day Mm. Um, that are affected by it, right? You know, the the millionaires and the billionaires have got enough cash to not have to worry. But about. it's the stress testing of you know taking on the mortgage and realizing that yeah things things can change and you know put. I think the lending here is done responsibly. There's there's affordability checks in place, yeah. and you have to put twenty percent of down. In the You've property got as a well. twenty percent down so payment. Not many, but you know, you know, that's a lot of money. Some and especially mm. the house prices now. Mm. you know it, not many people can 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 afford that so uh, you know at least that's kind of counteracting um you know irresponsible lending because they can't lend in the first place but do you ever see them relaxing that even more for example like say for example that the the property what, prices 15 percent ltv no but i mean what? um if, say for example uh in england you're a first time buyer you can yep. get 10 percent mm -hmm. Now, if property prices keep on increasing, then it's obviously potentially could slow down the market for buying. And then they, I mean, they relax it from 25 to 20. Do you think it could go lower? Do you think they would look at going lower to, to basically create a, a... Well, they had a help to buy scheme that, again, helped, you know, 5% unit to put 5% down. In the UAE? In, oh, in the UK, this was. Yeah, yeah. In the UAE, um, it's, a risk, it's a risk decision for the banks to decide because... 
if they see Dubai as a more stable offering, yeah. then and and the and the world of lending is more competitive, and they want to make better returns for their their money, then then that is an option for them to do. I mean, banks have already started to lump in some of the upfront purchase costs into the mortgage product, which is a relatively new thing. And again, that's that means that I only need twenty percent, and I can throw all the additional costs that the six or seven percent, you know, that you're paying agents yeah. or the lands department that they can, can be wrapped that, up into a into the 25 mortgage, year yeah. mortgage. So you kind of forget about it. <laughs> it's, it's there. But um, so that allows, you know, that does help the affordability. I mean, I've always said that we should, there should be a bit more leniency with, uh, you know, true end users and, and people who are living in the property where there isn't the rental voids that you would see of course, you, you know, there's the argument that you, if you lost your mm. job, you'd leave, but you'd then just switch to a, a buy to let as you would in the UK. We don't see that product here, so that would help the, that would help push the end user to, to get a better deal than than yeah. what they get currently. And what is funny as well is what I always found quite fascinating about the UAE market is, why is it that the buyer pays the commission and not the seller? really it's a really um re- when you think well, about it it's though. all net 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 isn't it net, yeah. net, net to me <laughs> it is a it is it is a different dynamic to because you you know the agent is you know the seller is instructing the agent to provide that service and then the but the argue the, the argument is um well if you know if they've got a factor in a two percent agents the price is two percent more which it's all cyclical so you know i you know remember the days when you know, if there's distress in the market, you can you can negotiate any. The rule is two percent both parties, but it's negotiable. So if the contract, you know, the contract's two percent, two percent, then then that's what it is. That's what the agreement is. But in a down market, you might the buyer might say, well, you you pay, you pay it, seller, because mm. you're you're distressed, and I don't, you know. And likewise, in a in a frothy market, yeah, the buyer, you know, the seller will say, you pay for the the upfront. It's more typical that the buyer does pay, but it is negotiable and and uh, that discussion could or should be had. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you for for, for that golden bit of knowledge right there. But um, <laughs> in terms of a, in terms of a marketplace as itself, so you obviously mm-hmm. got a PhD in 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 the UAE real estate sector for um, uh, commercial surveying, right? Mm-hmm. So, but as as a as a market itself now, mm-hmm. the UAE. Like it's such a strong economy, like it's it's a hub, it's vibrant. People love coming here, you know. Um, where where does it kind of position itself now from like a global leader in terms of markets? Because like you say, it's evolving constantly. They are, you know, some of the stuff that I was learning last week in the podcast with mm. with Danny, the real estate agent. You know, they are really becoming so much more due diligent in, and I mean. 12 years ago you could buy a house by signing the back of a napkin do you know what I mean so like yeah. now it's completely changed it's got so many more processes and so on so yeah, yeah I mean how does that make it position as a, as a place globally for real estate investments well I think the regulation helps investor confidence you know the, the, um, one of the things that Dubai land uh, have been working hard on over the last well i say 12 years just so I don't sound as dated <laughs> is that is the transparency so externally jll the the property um consultancy group they do an annual or sorry every two years they do a a global transparency index and that and dubai land have been really um proactive to accommodate some of the recommendations of that report to improve investor uh, relation so that you know a lot of that is regulation you know title deed regulation uh, when you're flipping properties if you know the fl- the old school flipping writing on the back of a napkin kind of thing as you said you know that's all now regulated with off-plan title deed registration if I buy an off-plan unit I need to pay the developer 25 percent of that contract before I can sell it on to you so there isn't that flipping there isn't that opportunity to, to queue up go to the back of the queue and and sell it on to someone else like like what we may have seen before <laughs> so um 
Uh, I just don't like queuing, although British people do like queuing, so it's a bit of an odd dynamic. Um, I don't like making money, clearly. But um, yeah, so uh, so the regulations have improved. So there's the, the off-plan market, which is, is much more uh, regulated. Even as a buyer, you've got escrow accounts now. So it's all done on a payment, uh, you know, payment yeah. plan. So it's a regulated account that the developer can't get the funds to until milestones have been reached so it's all from their side as well yeah, yeah. so there's a bit of a bit more of a regulation control so the you know rera are you know they overlook those those processes and that you know money is released at, at construction milestones so it stops the developer running away with with whatever money that mm. they've captured from the buyers um there's the legal you know title regulation that means that you know, us as foreign nationals can buy into certain prod- products in a in a f- freehold ownership basis. Um, there's laws on 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 landlord and tenant, which has changed since I've been here to, to regulate that relationship between you know the property owner and and the and the and the tenant. Mm. So that that helps. You know, that all helps with with um, you know transparency, the way information is is shared publicly. So. You know, when, as I said, when if we were buying something 10, 10 years ago in Dubai, if you tried to find a transaction of that building for the unit that you were looking at, it would be near on impossible. So you'd have to say, if I'm going to take a punt on Dubai, I'm going to use a 10, 10% yield on whatever the rent is at that time. And that might be an, a rational way of deciding that that was the right price to pay mm. for that unit. But of course, now we can see, we hear fantastic commentary from, the likes of you know property finder data finder property monitor that you know the information's there the transactions are there dld published daily transactions as well so if we are buying in the market we're buying with a more educated view although yeah, yeah. you know you're buying whatever the last person paid for the unit it's not necessarily the single dimension that we should look at but at least we can sit in ballparks and say you know i'm not buying at an all-time low i'm not buying at an all-time high what's my holding period can i see these bumpy bits out can i you know manage the volatility am i protected is my money in a good pegged currency which is important you know it's dollar denominated so you're basically buying and and saving if 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 we want to call real estate a savings plan in, in a dollar denominated currency so it's got a lot of things going for it and it's as i said at the start it's done a lot on transparency which i think gives people confidence to invest here and clearly with with the stats that you mentioned and the transactional levels that that uh, your last guest was getting he's, he's doing well for himself based off of the hard work of DLD yeah yeah hundred percent now as the UAE market evolves um, obviously previously when the UAE wasn't so established um, you know they s- signed an agreement to be pegged to the dollar Mm-hmm. Um, and with that, obviously, allowed that you know if the market did go up or down, you know it wouldn't have any interaction with what what it meant with being connected to the states. Now, mm. as it's becoming more of a global leader, what would be the impact if they was to turn around and say, okay, well, you know, we're actually able to stand here alone. We okay. don't need to be pegged to you anymore because you know we're we're, we're a global hub. Yeah, you know. Great for logistics, great for flying, mm-hmm. traveling. You know, everything's looking quite good. So, what? What? I mean, would it ever happen? Do you think? And if it did, what okay. would be what the impact? The um, it's it's a difficult because again, any governments with any of these decisions have to. There's a trade off between what they what they're doing. So, you know, having a currency, having your currency pegged to a sort of a safe haven global currency like the US dollar. Um, yeah, historically. Safe, so, I was going to say safe uh, haven. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that, uh, I mean, that that's important to, to bring, again, the, the investment flow. So if you, if you, um, you know, property investors don't like managing currency risk, it's a huge unknown. When you're buying property in, a, in another country, Let's say, I mean, Turkey is a good example with the lira. You know, you buy, you buy at point, point X, you sell at point Y. There's a huge gap in what you're getting back in your home currency. 
because you're playing the currency game. Yeah. Whereas in Dubai, you you don't have to worry about you know, that. You, you, there's enough <clears throat> enough movement elsewhere for, for you to worry about. But there's um yeah you don't, you're not managing that currency risk. So it's a big uncertainty that that attracts property investors here. You you, you basically so you'd be removing that. Um, the do so you they, think do so you think they would ever do it though? Well, nothing's impossible. So they they may do it, but it's again it's you know you're managing. You you know they've taken the position that they want more exchange rate certainty than than other monetary policy components. So we, you know inflation has been high in Dubai. You know if you look back at inflation, it was you know up at twelve percent at some at some t- points in time. So mm. it lost its ability to manage inflation versus having the positive benefits of of a US pegged mm. currency um, if it floats itself f- freely then you and I might choose to Im- invest or save or store our our savings in our in in other global currencies and that would weaken the dirham and there'd be implications of those things whereas at the moment we might you know there's a bit of you might store some of it in dirhams you might have some in dollars mm. you might have some in, so there might be a big implication there um at, at the moment, I, I I hear that there's no intention to change that relationship. But again, Who knows? as with many government decisions, it's 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 an un, it's an unknown. And, mm. But I but I think it brings a lot of benefit from the investment side, particularly property investment around currency risk, to have the U.S. denominated component with it. Right. So there's a, there's a few more topics I want to really um, touch on pre, prior to us kind of like ending the podcast and so on okay. so um obviously what we couldn't control is covid so from 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 you as a professor that kind of teaches and 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 you know tutors people on on the market it's like what's what has the impact actually been like realistically factually what's the actual impact been on has it actually got because previously Everyone was thinking doom and gloom, but you know the way the market's reacted now, has it actually been more of a benefit than anything else? Well, I think in my, I mean, earlier, I mean, I was asked to, at the start of of the COVID pandemic to sort of assess whether what how I saw it, and I did. I kind of, I kind of gave. I mean, I'm not giving myself credit here, but I called it a V shape. It would be a quick V shape reversion because you're basically pausing the economy. Everyone's like at home. So there's going to be a big fallout because, you know, no one's spending, no one's coming here on holiday. You know, everyone's trying to stay, stay steady. So, uh, you know, once that pause button is, 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 is released, then of course it would, there would be some elasticity to, for it to pop back up. So there's been some growth, but it's, it's a rebound. It's a rebound from, from where we were. So if you smooth that, you know, if you took the points two years ago, We've probably seen a, a very smooth gradual increase and we're not seeing that you know if we say it's gone up 30 percent 40 percent it sounds it sounds a lot it sounds a lot but, but it dropped that far it's based on yeah, yeah. so it was a, again an emotional reaction to 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 the event that again was bred, bred from uncertainty how long are we gonna be living through this is it gonna you know are we is there gonna if it goes on for longer are we are we losing our jobs? Are we losing our livelihoods, and so on? So, um, so I think the impacts of of just ex- maybe they, you know, from from an academic perspective, from an econ- economic perspective, they probably accelerated trends that were always going to happen. You know, digitalization, mm-hmm. working remotely, companies didn't really like it as an option. You know, it wasn't something that you'd sit down with your line manager and say, "Oh, um, can I have three days a week at home to work?" or can it, I work like a bit enough. more flexibly? <laughs> Previous um, to that, they'd be like, "Oh my God, what do you mean three days?" But you know, home? then then it's like, "Well, this is the only option." So this is the new you know, norm. We, we do trust you to work at home. We mm. we're okay with it now. But it was forced on us. So, but now we're starting to realise um, that it. You know, there's a lot of, or firms are starting to realise there's a lot of benefit in allowing people that autonomy to to decide how they want to work, how they want to interact with colleagues in the office outside the office it's not gonna it's not likely to be we all just now go well i love working at home i'm going to continue with the next 30 years of my life working at home because it's going to be 
it's going to be a rare rare position to be in i think but there's certain elements where we think okay we've lived through it it wasn't a complete disaster for for us as a business we learned a lot of positives from uh working with our global offices from an individual perspective so um i think we'll find you know obviously when you have these reactions we think very you know we we tend to you know we tend to turn short term things into long term trends when actually they're just reactive so you know the death of the retail the death of the office kind of we're not going to see came back. that it came back like yeah. quite quite quickly didn't it and you know we we're in a blessed position in the UAE where we have you know good internet we have good healthcare we don't, didn't probably need to but there are other geographies that you know the office environment provides those essential you know business infrastructures so yeah. going to the office and, and and graduates as well you know if you're a graduate you can't train a graduate from you can't do a two year graduate program online you know, you know it's someone puts you around there you know they tells them tells them their 30 year life story and you and you learn learn from them so no i think there's you know there's a lot of lessons that we learn um I think, as I say, real estate is is probably benefited actually from it all because people just see the value in, in in the residential spaces and and a lot of institutional money is now going into, you know, the institutionalization of residential blocks and managed yeah. blocks. So, um, I think, as I say, it's just it's just accelerated some of the trends that were already underlying, because we've got internet, we've got technology, we've got abilities to work we can decentralize ourselves away from a city we can see the added benefits of being in a in a city so um yeah i i i you know i think it will be a a positive thing because we're adapting to you know offices for example retail spaces are adapting to these yeah. these shocks and they're reinventing themselves mm. to what the future would have been anyway Interesting question I'm about to ask you here. Okay. I, I actually, uh, I'm going to catch you a bit off guard. So <laughs> interesting response. And, and, you know, one of the things that a lot of people say about Dubai is it's a bubble. Mm -hmm. And you've just hit the nail on the head there because we're ahead of the world, really, aren't we? I mean, let's go back to Christmas. Countries in Europe were going into lockdown because there was a, an outbreak in cases. So we are surviving and thriving um, other places in the world are not so taking your professor hat off is yeah. that is that us being in a bubble it's fixed or yeah. <laughs> is that being us being in a bubble or is that us being in a well-led country yeah i mean my, i would say the governance is is probably what i mean if we look at retail as an example within the you know a lot of the things that the retail developers are doing are already factoring in, you know, experience-led shopping, you know, not relying on, you know, working with the internet to to boost sales rather than worrying about online taking over from. So space, spe retail spaces are, you know, social spaces, experience-led spaces, and 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 Dubai, I think you know, the Dubai retail arena is is doing a lot of innovative stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, coming back to I think the government, I think the UAE benefits from from having a long long-standing ruler of of Dubai, yeah. and that and that structure isn't political wins. So in the UK, where you know you've got Labour and Conservative, and you've got that, we'll change the policy because you know the other party that was in power made that policy, made yeah. that policy. So we've got to change it. It's like a manager; yeah. the new manager comes in, they change everything. But here they just here want, you've got the state. You know, they want every. I I feel like they want everyone yeah. to thrive, right? Yeah. And the vision is, the vision is you know a good vision in any in a business, is not on short termism. It's, it's long like term, where do yeah. we want to be, you know, in twenty thirty years, and how are we going to get there? Yeah. And then the you know, du, you know, du, the, or Dubai started off trying to look at the good examples of how cities worked in London, Europe. And so it's almost like as much as people don't feel Dubai is planned, a lot of it was brought from. You know British architects or or you know Western examples to say these things worked and those things didn't work. So it is it is it is through good governance I think that um, Dubai or the UAE is able to offer what it 
does because yeah. and I think it is because you have that stability of of power at the top that isn't isn't you know you're not trying to get one one up on on the other yeah on, or you're not trying to get people's votes you you sign up to Dubai you live here you 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 know you abide by you the don't. rules yeah so yeah. That leads perfectly, <laughs> absolutely perfectly um, onto um, the kind of like final topic that I really wanted to discuss with you because I love having these discussions with really well-educated people because... So you, I leave? <laughs> <laughs> you, Where'd you come in? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you understand, like say, like, okay, you're a professor in real estate, yeah. but you understand like world global kind of like economics and, and how things work and you, you hit the nail on the head there right now British politics right now and, and and this is a topic that I wanted to discuss with you because it's like okay forget the whole professor this that yeah <laughs> let's go on personal um, mm -hmm. opinions and, and both being British um, it's in a bit of a mess right now isn't it the UK <laughs> um, yeah I mean I guess I mean, define a mess. I mean, it's got a lot of... Uh, well, when you've got yeah. your Prime Minister making accusations about Jimmy Savile in the Houses of yeah. Parliament, and it's not true. I mean, that's a pretty bad... Mm. You know, I mean... Yeah, I think, I mean, there's... Yeah, there is some issues that are there with... I mean, I haven't... To be, honest, to be completely honest, I'm not trying to dodge the question. I just haven't paid too much attention. To, I see, I see, obviously... Yeah. Uh, media and and uh things coming through on 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 the UK and and the and, and different politics and stuff but i just don't do you know what i don't understand mm. is like is how how i mean like if i was the uae government mm. i'd actually be like we're the uae government but we're also a consultant i'll come and teach you how to run your countries because mm. it's not like you say i think i think that's one thing that you mentioned in that previous question that you was mm. answering for me mm. is that you know, you haven't got two parties um, just trying to get one up on it, on each other. Mm. You know, I think I, I, at the moment it's like kind of like I don't even know who I would want. I don't know if I would want Labour to, to go in. I mean, I live mm. there. Mm. I'm, I'm thinking more of family than anything mm. else. But it's got to the point now where both options are really bad. Mm -hmm. don't, don't trust them. Um, I think there's obviously huge outroar recently with the fact that you know, people was in lockdown, couldn't see their families, and then it turned out that Downing Street hosted a number of multiple parties mm -hmm. whilst everyone, you know, I mean, the Queen had to sit at a funeral of her husband alone because mm -hmm. of the regulations they put in place, but yet they was partying. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you, you, you wonder how these people... Well, again, it's that perception that we're receiving or the information you're receiving, on it's, it's, it's a trust thing, isn't it? It's like, people are losing trust because the credibility is being questioned about yeah. about that so you know you you want governments to lead you know and make decisions on on the big things like how are we going to attract businesses to come to the UK because we've just signed a deal to get out of Europe mm. you know not you know we had a party during during lockdown so it's it's kind of like there's some bigger things happening that you'd want the government to sort of Focus be on. more, be more vocal. And again, it's you're talking about political switches during the term of a relatively short term of five years. You know, two years in or two or three years into that, you're already discussing. We should Labour be in? I mean, not you, but people are in the media are discussing. Mm. You know, should we have this part of that? It's not good for the stability of of any policy there. If if at all, you know, I've not heard too many. <laughs> policies of how how the uk is going to manage um obviously they're signing trade deals with with countries and so on and, and the uae is one of the areas that they're targeting to to do those with the, mm. obviously the long-term history that britain has had with the uae so yeah i i mean i you know yeah i haven't i haven't got a massive view on it i just it, it just looks from the outside it looks like there's a lot of issues to to deal with yeah um Maybe we need a professor in uh, real estate to, uh, <laughs> to take over as the leader of the country. No, but no, honestly, it's um, it's been a really fascinating chat and, and, and one that I was actually looking forward to. You know, you've brought a completely different demographic to, to the podcast and just want to thank you for taking the time out of your day 
just oh, to sort of have a little bit more of a yeah. chat with um, a less educated young man. But uh, I felt like I... Uh, we're all, I, inter- we're all, we're, all of us are learning. And, uh, yeah, I actually, I actually was told when I was younger, the day you stop learning is the day you should retire. Yeah. Um, because you're always learning like every day. And, and I've learned a lot here as well. And, and, you know, thanks for sharing that wisdom with us. And obviously I'm sure my, my audience as well is going to be um, enjoying this as well because... It doesn't do what we've talked about today. Doesn't just get them to understand from a from a from from let's say um, a study perspective. It's also helping people on an educational basis of if they're actually looking to buy and some of the tips that we talked about um, and and why it is becoming more safe and, and the governance they've got in place to make it a more safer place to invest your your money in in this market. So um, thank you very much. I will take back what I used to say about um, teachers that um, there's no place for university because there clearly is um, because you know I've spent an hour with you and I found it very valuable so um, so yeah I might just sneak into your classes in future well the door's always open nice one one. (laughs) I I might get a nice bill at the end but (laughs) oh well Um, no on a serious note thank you very much and guys uh, if you enjoyed that podcast as much as we did then head over to our pages and give us a comment five star review or if it's first time listening hit the subscribe button because we do this and i sit with some of the most educated people in whatever space i decide to discuss on that particular topic i always want to try and bring you something fascinating or educational to help you my audience make better decisions or just listen to a really interesting story and and today was definitely one of them so um like i say we would love it if you could head over to the to the pages and give us a, a five-star review or even just a follow or comment. Let me know what you loved about the podcast. Um, we're always interested to get your feedback because we do it for you guys. So until next time, we'll see you soon.